Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Gabe Oberlin. He's going to share a passion project of his that we just learned, um, wireless technology ham radio resources. So uh, his request is that we ask questions as the presentation is going and this be conversational. So thank you for joining uh, us today. And Gabe, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I will watch the chat. Okay, thank you, Tracy, for that introduction. And welcome everyone that, that is here this morning to hear about wireless technology and ham radio resources. And uh, to introduce myself, I'm Gabe Oberlin. I'm, it's my 21st year teaching at Patrick Henry High School. I'm a satellite program for the Four County Career Center. So I'm a career tech teacher. I have two pathways and one is uh, engineering and um, so I kind of stumbled into ham radio along my journey, and um, it really is a significant resource that teachers have at your disposal, and hopefully you'll come out of this presentation with some ideas and maybe even uh, might uh, take advantage of some of these things. So uh, first of all, uh, I'm not sure. There we go. What is ham radio? So amateur radio is um, often referred to as ham radio, and it's a popular hobby. There's people all over the country, all over the world that uh, like to play around with radios, and they uh, really, uh, it started out from the beginning with with Morse code and um, you can use it to talk to your buddies across town or all over the world. And I've talked to people in dozens of state of uh, almost every state, um, like dozens of countries and um, you don't need a cell phone. You don't, or any kind of phone. It's fun, it's educational and you know, you see people doing this into their senior years. In fact, it's a really during the daytime, it's a, a lot of, of seniors that are involved. So ham radio operators tend to skew a little on the older side and probably more male, but not exclusively male and not exclusively older. And there are uh, plenty of young hams out there that really enjoy the hobby. But why ham? You know, why do they, why uh, a ham? So um, now you got to think this goes back 100 years. And ham 100 years ago was sort of a term for, you know, you, could, you were hamming it up or it was somebody that was, if you were ham handed, maybe you didn't, uh, uh, somebody, it was a little bit of a put down. Right, so you got an amateur radio operator, somebody that just bought a radio and they're trying to get on the air and maybe they're not doing that great of a job and they haven't had on the job training. They're not working with the best equipment. So, you know, they're, when you get started at something like that, you're clumsy and you're not doing things exactly right, but you're learning. And, um, but hams were like, well, you know, uh, we might be amateurs, but, uh, you know, we're not giving up. And this is something that we're passionate about. And a lot of it back then was building your own equipment and learning about the cutting edge of technology. And that part of it is still accurate, that hams are, are looking into the new ways to communicate and the newest equipment and um, We'll get into that a little bit more later. So how did I get wrapped up into amateur radio? Well, I don't know if you know um, Tad Deuce or any of those guys with the National Robotics Challenge and uh, the uh, there's some, a lot of stuff going on that um, with the Ohio Technology and Engineering Educators Association. But we have, this is really a, it's kind of started to spread 
nationally, but this is a, an Ohio initiative, this drones in school program. And I just um, was something that I saw and um, I was uh, interested in drones, um, probably started about 10, 12 years ago. But there's a program, this drones in school, and there's, if you Google it, it's um, easy to find. There's a lot of resources if you want to use the curriculum. It gets into CAD design, it gets into marketing, it gets into a lot of things, but it really gets into building drones and how do you do that? Well, the easiest way is to start out with a kit. So here's the kit, and this is a, a basic one. Um, this is you know, a few few months old, the prices might have changed a little bit, um, but um, you can see here what a basic kit includes. It's it's a drone with a battery charger. You got a controller in here. You got the uh, the first person view goggles, and this is the part that gets you into trouble because if you read there. In the fine print, it says this product requires an amateur radio license to operate legally in the US. And so I got that on there twice somehow. Um, here it is. This is this is law. The FCC regulates radio communications and those goggles. So if I'm um, if you're just if you're controlling that drone which you can do that kind of like you would do an rc car or rc boat but for that drone to transmit back to you that takes a, a radio frequency that is not uh, permitted but without a license and so it gets into uh, some legal things that you know, you could be, if you don't know what you're doing, you could be interfering with, with other types of radio operations. And that's why they, they require the, the radio license to use those type of first person view goggles. Now, there's a lot of drones you could use that commute, that work over Wi-Fi radio frequencies. And those are the ones like the DJIs where you use your cell phone for your video. So anything with a cell phone uh, for your video would not require the, the, um, the ham radio license. But if you want to get into these racing drones that do, that's when you get into these, these legal uh, implications. So here's a chart. This one, uh, hams use it all the time. And this is, there's a lot in here to unpack, but if you think about the uh, radio frequency spectrum, you know, that is, uh, that goes all the way from, um, you know, microwaves, which are uh, in the gigahertz down to these, uh, this really low 135 kilohertz. You get below that and you get into, I think, um, AM radio frequencies. Uh, if you think about uh, FM radio frequencies, what kind of numbers are those? All right, you're talking about, uh, say, 80 and uh, maybe 88 uh, megahertz up to, I think it's like 107 or 108 megahertz. So you're looking at um, something over here between the just uh, above or I guess below would be the two meter, uh, two meter frequencies. Um, so at all there's there's um, aviation uses that fit in between here. There's uh, public safety uses. You talk about your uh, public television. All those are fitting into different areas here. And so it's important to know about these different uh, bands that you're uh, that you're allowed to use, and make sure you stay within those bands. So, um, as far as becoming a ham, getting that license, it's really it's very doable. It's a 35 question exam. They give you all the questions. There's a lot of 
more questions than they'll ask you those. So you'll, they give you also all the answers. And this is run through the American Radio Relay League, which is the largest organization of amateur radio uh, uh, enthusiasts. And um, they oversee this. So we are sort of a, a self-regulating body. And uh, it's not a requirement to be a member of the American Radio Relay League to get your ham radio license. But if you do become a member, there are definitely benefits. So uh, the first step would be check out the uh, ARRL website. And they still do, they still print a lot of books. And um, they like to, um, get their books out there. Now, um, I know we're kind of switching more to digital versions of these things. And I think in some ways, the league is still, uh, they still like their, their hard copies. That might have something to do with how the group tends to be skewed a little older for them, um, in general. So, there are three levels of amateur radio license. The only one you would need if you're gonna do drones in school or just to get your foot in the door and have access to, to these benefits. And there are a lot of benefits to becoming an amateur radio license holder. The first one is a technician class. And I've talked to plenty of people that have studied, uh, done some practice tests and maybe studied hard for a couple of days and and take the test, or I shouldn't say too hard, but you don't need 100% to get your license. Uh, and the, uh, the there's a second test for the general. That, um, if you wanna do the worldwide stuff, you need to get your general. And Amateur Extra just gives you all access to all the codes. So this is a, this is a copy of my license. I'm, I'm actually an extra now, and I've got a new call sign. Um, my new call sign is AF8GO, Alpha Foxtrot 8 Golf Oscar. My old one was Kilo 8 PHP, which was for Patrick Henry Patriots. Um, but uh, there is now a, uh, it costs 14 or $15 to take the test. And there is a $35 licensing fee that goes to the FCC. But uh, really, pretty affordable um, considering what you could get from this as an educator. So here's a website that I would really recommend if you were interested in getting your license, hamstudy.org. These guys are nationwide and they just are dedicated to getting new hams, uh, on the air and you can do everything as far as registering for your for your FCC uh, ID number and you take the test online you don't even, you can take practice tests here so they make it really easy like when I took mine before covid I had to find uh, testing location. It was all done on paper and COVID really forced the league to go digital with this. And I'd say that you still can't, I know that you still can take a pencil and paper test in some locations, but the majority of folks now are doing theirs online. So um, one of my students over Thanksgiving break decided that he was going to sign up and take his test uh, over the Thanksgiving break. He just studied hard over Thanksgiving break and he got his technician's license. So I've got some more students that are interested. And it's really, uh, you would be amazed how many scholarships are available for young hams. And it doesn't matter what you study. Like if you're going to college and you have your ham radio license, they're literally, uh, dozens, maybe over a hundred uh, scholarships available for your students, if you can get them to pass their technician license. 
and a lot of this stuff for a STEM educator, these are these. This is content that relates directly to your curriculum, and there are resources from ARRL that you can use to prepare your lessons. And they'll, there's even uh, resources available in the form of uh, grants, which we'll get to that too. So the American Radio Relay League, here's a picture I took of the headquarters. And um, it's a nonprofit organization been around since 1914. And it uh, represents us in the, as far as uh, lobbying with the federal government, with the FCC, and um, they have a ton of resources there and they're really great people and they're just regular folks out there. They're enthusiastic about amateur radio and they're and enthusiastic about education and uh, they really r roll out the red carpet for teachers. I mean, if you if you show up to one of their uh, professional development uh, sessions, they really take great care of you. So this is the guy that started the league and um, he was a businessman, an engineer, an inventor, and uh, they started out in Connecticut. And Connecticut was really, um, you know, not, I don't think, thought of as, you know, a big hub for the industrial revolution, but there was a lot going on there. Uh, a lot of automotive things were going on at this time, you know, the internal combustion engine was just getting started. I know uh, this guy, uh, Hiram Percy Maxim, uh, had built his own uh, internal combustion engine. Um, and, uh, but anyway, he had a, an early uh, Morse coder, we call that CW for continuous wave uh, radio and was communicating with local hands, but he was trying to get a hold of one of his buddies and conditions weren't that great. And so he knew of another guy halfway between him and his buddy and was able to get a hold of that guy to relay his message to the next person. And so, um, this idea that you would have a radio relay where you could convey messages from one operator to the next across the country. And you got to think this was before long distance phone service. And this was, uh, they actually had, uh, they would have a race to see how fast they could get a signal across the country to and back. And, um, you know, so, it was a great way, even in the early days of telephone, you think about uh, some of us that grew up in the 70s and 80s and even in the early 90s might remember not being able to call long distance because it costs you a lot of money. And if you lived in a city, you're good to go. But if you lived out in the country, you know, sometimes it might cost you big bucks just to make a 10 minute call to the next town, if it was in a different county or in a different service area. So, um, you know, a lot of early, uh, older hams use this as a way to communicate with family members. Um, and, but that whole idea was initiated by this guy. So wireless technology, uh, it is not an old, I mean, it's old, but there are tons of applications of this on a daily basis. We depend on this so much we don't, we take it for granted. I mean, you think of the, what I have listed here, the Bluetooth deep space, we don't use personally, but uh, two-way radios. Uh, cellular telephone is basically a radio with a computer attached to it that will fit in your pocket. All that is in radio frequencies. And um, the you one of the, of the things I don't have listed here in my um, my slides, but it's this spread spectrum frequency hopping that uh, Hetty Lamar came up with, and she's a real 
innovator that happened uh, that lived during the Second World War. Um, and but her her ideas and invention uh, really revolutionized radio technology. Um, PDAs are not that big anymore, but we use Wi-Fi a lot, uh, GPS, uh, garage door openers. I think we all probably a lot. Most of us use that on a daily basis. Uh, just your regular old radio in your car, satellite television, radio, broad, any regular broadcast television, you use a keyless entry, uh, baby monitors, toothbrushes. I mean, there's, um, I saw something on a, um, it had to do with a, uh, some sort of a, a toilet with a radio sensor in it that did, monitored your uh, health or something i don't know it's uh so there's a ton of applications for wireless technology and there's going to be more all of your uh, if you have uh wireless uh if you use your alexa or your google assistant to turn lights on and off all that is wireless technology and learning about amateur learning about it from the angle of amateur radio is going to give you resources that help you teach it in a way that that hopefully will enrich your curriculum. So the Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology, and they just came out with the new dates. And if you go to the ARRL website and, and look this up, uh, you can find the application. And this is a week-long Teachers Institute, it's, it is expenses paid and they pay for, I went last year, they paid my mileage to drive to and from the airport. They paid for my parking at the airport. They paid for my airfare. They paid for a hotel. They gave me $50 a day and I don't even think I ate $50 a day worth of food. They gave it to me, gave it to all of us. Um, you just had to turn in your receipts. They um, gave us tons of, uh, I can go to the next slide. Well, here's me at the airport. Uh, this is the, the front uh, of the uh, headquarters here. Got a nice sign out there. But um, Teachers Institute, they started that in 2004. And they, there are, I think there, uh, there is a session in Dayton. If you don't want to go clear to um, Connecticut, that um, Dayton actually is a really important place for uh, amateur radio, and they have the Hamvention. People come from all over the world to Dayton for amateur radio, and so they, I think they work it in with that Dayton Hamvention, uh, which is in the summer. I think in July, I could get you a date on that, but um, I'm not sure if they have six this year. There's a T2 that, that I'm planning to go to this year. Uh, they've had over 700 teachers so far go through. It's a small group. I think we had, I don't know, 12 or 14 in mind, but uh, this is uh, my, uh, instructor, and this is just from my seat, and you're at your computer, you're working with electronics, you're learning hands-on, and a lot of this stuff, I was just really felt fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to try this stuff out. Instead of, it seems like so many times when I am doing something new in the classroom, I'm doing it on the fly, Technology moves fast and you're always trying to stay on top of things. And that means you're learning. You're learning uh, with the kids, but you got to try and stay one step ahead. And it's not like you're teaching history where you know, most of that's not going to change. This is, technology is always, if you're teaching technology, it's always going to be something new. So um, there's a lot thrown at you. Um, and 
you know, he relates this to taking a sip through a fire hose. Um, I mean, they don't kill you with this. There's no exam, uh, but it does challenge you to learn some new things. There'll be things that build on, on technology that you're already familiar with. So it's, don't be intimidated by that. I mean, we had uh, all kinds of grade levels represented down to, I think we had a kindergarten teacher who came uh, because her family was interested in ham radio, but um, this is all paid for by hams. It is not, you know, they're through the radio relay dues. It's, it is hams that believe in education and want to promote radio technology. They want, they want young people to understand how important this technology is, and they want to give teachers the resources to be able to instruct their students in radio technology and wireless technology. So this is not a ham radio license class. You're not going through the book. They did give us all the opportunity to test at the end of the week, and several of us, I actually sat for my amateur extra, which is the highest level license there at at uh, the headquarters, which I am uh, really proud of the fact that I was able to pass my amateur extra exam at uh, headquarters. So that's kind of a badge of honor that I wear. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't show up anywhere, but um, for me, that was cool. But several, several of the teachers that were not licensed when they went were able to pass their technician test. Um, and this is not bleeding edge technology. So it's, there's some stuff that you, maybe you already have done, but there's, I guarantee there's a lot of uh, new stuff. It's not aimed at a particular type of student or teacher. Uh, in this case, the student is the teacher. Uh, you could be, we had physics teachers. We had a band teacher. We had, um, high school, middle school, elementary. Um, so if you're a teacher and you want to do some professional development, if you want to go to Connecticut for a week, all expenses paid, this is a great opportunity. And if you want to take your spouse or your significant other, they don't care. I mean, they, they're not going to pay for their transportation, but, um, you know, there's plenty of room in that hotel room and it was it was a nice hotel room with a nice lobby and they had uh, a lot of uh, activity down there there were other groups I think there was a big group of, of uh, kids and parents there for some kind of a uh, hockey or lacrosse or soccer tournament I don't know but um, anyhow um, one day we set up some radio equipment outside. Uh, they made, they barbecued burgers and hot dogs for us. Uh, this is Dave Minster at the radio here. He's operating uh, CW or that's AM speak for Morse code. Um, and he had spoke to us at one day and gave us his uh, background and how he got started and how a teacher was really influential in his experience and and uh, love of, of amateur radio um, so but uh, there's several of us here this um, this guy here um, is going to be instructing Adam I can't think of his last name this guy is from Dallas Texas uh, with this was um, this guy was a an a Navajo Indian from the, and he came and he's teaching at a, actually at the college level, at the community college level, wanted to incorporate his. So that's, uh, you meet some interesting folks um, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful location and uh, just a, had a wonderful time with lots of excellent people. So here's a pile of goodies. Uh, this is, the list is not exactly what I got, but um, we got our T-shirt, uh, a basic electronics kit. Uh, I got a 
an oscilloscope that I could hook up to my computer. I still haven't figured out how to use that in class yet, but um, this, uh, so this won't be exactly what you get, but they literally supplied us with a couple of hundred dollars worth of equipment that definitely was, was applicable to, to what we're teaching in our STEM classroom. So, and they teach you how to use it. That's, that's the part that I had not been able to find before I found TI. I was like, how do I program an Arduino board or uh, ESP32 or how do I, what this unit wants me to solder? Well, they taught us how to solder the right way, you know, and I'd fumbled around with it before, but they really took the time and they didn't just throw you in front of the stuff. They had trained people there that could teach you how to do these basic things that you can then go on and teach your students. And I've got kids soldering like crazy now. It's, uh, it's really fun to watch them go. And um, I attribute a lot of the skills I learned here. So the whole idea, this, you know, they really base this on you know, this growth mindset. And I think this is important in education, especially in STEM education, you know, that the idea that we're going to be lifelong learners and the whole idea of, you know, being part of this, this maker movement that, you know, you're probably not going to be the one, first one to invent something, but you can make it and you can still learn how things work by making something. And then that might give you an idea how to make it a little different or, or put a couple ideas together. That's how we're going to come up with our, our next big thing. And I think training students in that growth mindset to make sure that they're not afraid to try something new is a, is a key factor in, in helping develop them to become problem solvers and uh, excel in the, uh, the world that we live in. So this is really based on project-based learning and that students like to learn by doing. And that's why they take the STEM classes. And so that gets us into these higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy that, that helps you them work towards this self-actualized person. And um, so we're gonna take these concepts and we're gonna apply them. It's not just, we're not just learning rote memory uh, knowledge, it's gonna be applied. And so you're really gonna get something that you can sink your teeth into and experiences then that they can take on and, and build on. And, and you don't need to, have, I have a really great shop. I, mean, I uh, inherited a, a traditional uh, technology program. I mean, I have a huge shop with workbenches and drill presses and table saws. I've got welders, I've got a furnace. We can do casting. We can, we got CNC, we've got a laser cutter. I've got, you know, um, close to 10 3D printers. Um, you can do a lot with a 3D printer and maybe a desktop laser cutter. You know, um, you can do this in the classroom. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have a huge shop uh, to be able to do some of these things. And so uh, just keep an open mind about that if you're starting from scratch. So uh, one thing that's really popular, it's, this is challenging and you would really need to be on it, work up to this, but the International Space Station does do links with schools. They love to do that. And so um, if you wanna build up to one of these uh, amateur radio on the International Space Station con connections, uh, that is something you can do, and you can do that. You would need your technician license to make that work, but um, if that's something that fits into your space curriculum, you know, this is something that that the folks at 
the league can help you accomplish. And, um, you know, it's uh, not something that you don't want to take this. This would be a step for someone that's really dedicated, though, uh, to make it happen. Uh, but there are resources out there to help you make it happen. So there's a lot of phone apps as far as satellite communications and you can, it's fun to even, if you look at these apps and you can help students understand how some of these uh, satellites move and look for when is there a flyover? You know, when would that window of opportunity, this, this uh, satellite's going over the horizon and we can follow that and they can think about the world in a global way and, and um, so, but you can listen, you can listen with a $25 radio and I've got one right here. Let's see if it, yeah, it comes into focus. You can get one of these, the cheap Chinese made Bao Fang UV Bao Bao radio on Amazon and they probably get it to you the next day. And if you look up the frequencies, you just dial it in. You can listen all day on one of these without even getting the license. And if you knew when the satellite or the International Space, Space Station was coming over, uh, you could use this. And I'll show you another radio that's just a receive only radio that's about the same price. This one, though, I can actually program it and I can speak to other hands with this, right? So, um, Gabe, when is, you put your, when you put the radio, you're, you're, we can't hear you. Sorry. Okay. Thanks for <laughs> no, letting me No, know. thanks. We appreciate seeing it, but it's hard yeah. to hear you. So maybe you can okay. show us and then tell us. Thanks. All right. Okay. So anyhow, that's the, um, this one's, anyhow. Um, so International Space Station, here's something that we did with some directional, you see, uh, if you ever watch these wildlife video shows where they're looking for, they're looking for the, the uh, radio collar on the animals. So that's using one of these directional type antennas. They showed us how to do that. Also how to make a game out of it with a little, instead of that collar on the, on the animal, then they've got just a little receiver that you can hide somewhere on the school campus and you can find that. They call that fox hunting. So th uh, this was our group that was doing that. And um, so here is a picture of the uh, W1AW, Whiskey One Alpha Whiskey Station. This is um, located here at the headquarters. And this is the building where the uh, home station is. And uh, this is sort of the mecca for amateur radio. And um, it's named after the uh, founder, Hiram Percy Maxim. His uh, call sign was W1A. And um, it's located there in Newington, Connecticut on the headquarters. And so I was, here's a picture of the inside, all the radio equipment that they had set up or a big chunk of it. And um, because I had my license and I was able to get on the air and operate and I was able to get a hold of some of my friends here in the Midwest, they turned the antenna. Normally they run up in North and South up and down the East coast, but uh, they turned the antennas uh, west for me, and I was able to make some contacts, which was really uh, neat and fun for for uh, my local group. Um, and there's a schedule when you can sign up. So uh, here I've got some links to some grants. Now these are uh, the ARRL grants. So they have a classroom grant. And I applied for one of this two thousand dollars worth of equipment. You tell them what equipment you want, and they'll buy it for you, and they'll send it to you. And um, it really 
uh, it was not that hard to, to fill out the form, the paperwork. And um, I can't remember. Well, you don't have to be, you don't have to have your license as long as you have someone with a license in your neighborhood that is willing to work with you. So if you work with your local amateur radio club, then you can apply for this, this station grant. And you, I used it to buy like a really nice top of the line uh, radio for my students, but you could use it to buy electronics kits or you could probably get drones or you could use your imagination, soldering kits. Um, I don't know uh, if you had some kind of something that worked with wireless technology, I think there's a good chance that you would get one. But I will say that it, it is slightly competitive. So going to TI definitely, I think is one of the requirements for that. And the other one, the Amateur Radio Digital Communications ARDC grant, uh, those could be a big one, and if you were really serious about building up a a group at your school, uh, an amateur radio club, or affiliating with the read it, um, the uh, American Radio Relay League, then you could work for that towards that amateur radio digital communications grant. And that's based on that's kind of an interesting story about some guys that were in the early days of the internet and were able to purchase a big chunk of IP addresses for a little bit of nothing. And then were able to turn around and sell them to, I think it was Amazon or Microsoft or a big Google or um, sold a big chunk of those IP addresses. They thought they were, they were setting them aside. So, amateur radio operators could use them if they got into digital communications wirelessly. And so they got a ton of money and one of their mandates is to support education. So you might want to check them out. And, uh, but I, I applied for one, uh, I was denied. They said I asked for a little bit too much. I think it was uh, in the, uh, I'm gonna say, like fifty thousand dollar range. So <laughs> I asked for a clubhouse and all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna pair it back and try for a smaller one. But anyhow, Gabe, can you? I, I, we just have a couple of minutes, and I um, I was just wondering. Um, I appreciate all the information about grants and everything. If you've never done this before, is the uh, teacher uh, academy that you went to is that something that you would go to first, or do you need to play around with some things first, or start working with someone? to go to something like that week long um, workshop. If I was just starting out, I've never done this before. Would you recommend I go there first or would you recommend I do some, some work and some reading on my own before I go? Do you need to have any knowledge before you head there? <laughs> you don't have to have any knowledge to go wow. to okay. EI1. They will take applications from any teacher That's great. in any subject and um, they just want to promote wireless technology across the curriculum. And um, if you'd like to go, and if you go to Connecticut, now what's in Connecticut? Not very much, but um, you're just a stone's throw from Boston. You're right, you're right between Boston and New York. Uh, you really, you could go, you could go early. They're only going to pay your room for that week, but maybe you went early and you stayed in New York City. They paid for that flight, whether or not you got there a few days early and stayed a few days late. So you could really uh, use it to kind of uh, see the East Coast a little bit. I know I'm going to go to, I spent a lot of time studying for that uh, amateur extra test. So I didn't get to see th as much as I'd like to. Now that I've got that license, uh, I want to go back for TI2 and I'm going to go to, I've never been to Rhode Island. You know, so 
Okay. It's a great opportunity. And really, uh, if you go to their website, it's an e it's easy to find the application. I mean, you probably will need to do a little research to think about how you'd like to apply wireless technology. But I think if you're in STEM, that's that's a piece yes. of cake. And this is this is I had no idea this was available. This was very informative. Uh, one of the participants, Cindy Ross, um, asked, she works with first and second year career tech teachers, so she'd love to share your presentation with some of her first and second year students, if you're willing. Cindy, we are recording this, and it will be available to you since you registered, so we can send you his all of his slides and everything, but uh, certainly I, I can see how many of our pre-service teachers would be in, in science and math and STEM education would love to uh, learn from you, and maybe we can connect and and have our students come and see all the great things you're doing with this because I I I'm su I had no idea I'm super I'm blown away so thank you so much for sharing this I don't know how I would have learned if you hadn't shared this with us today so oh. we really appreciate your willingness and your passion for the topic it really comes through um, it's 12 o'clock I don't know if anyone has another question they want to ask before we uh, go back to the main session uh, I did get a anyone have a question for I just keep motoring on. <laughs> Well, there's a couple slides here, but this is um, some things wow. that are going on. Get Look for your local club. They're a great resource. There's probably somebody there that'd be willing to work with you. And um, so it's, uh, as far wow. as I'm, I had no idea how much I would enjoy this. I actually kind of was dreading it. And then once I started to study it, um, fell in love, awesome. but... <laughs> I'm just in Patrick Henry, so we have we have teachers that that drive from BG, and yep, you know, if you'd sure. like to do, uh, if you'd like to come uh, visit and see what I do, or check out my shop, or uh, I'd I would be, be more amazing. Than happy and, Thank you so much. I'm going to put in the chat a uh, link to the evaluation. Uh, I got a text. There was a little bit of trouble with people getting back to the main session. Uh, they said they were going to open that back up again at noon if you tried to get there earlier. Well, we haven't. But um, so the evaluation, if you wouldn't mind taking the um, taking the evaluation. And I think we need to head over to that main session because I think I'm on over there. So I'm going to end our presentation. And if you'd like to join us in the main session, that'd be great. Or you have this link now to click on to take the evaluation. Thank you so much, Gabe. We You're welcome, Tracy. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.